Hi, and welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. This is Jason Watt. And in this episode, uh, we'll be talking to Brandon Chapman. Brandon is actually our second tech entrepreneur of season four and our third overall. It's uh, pretty interesting. I like to see what people who are in the business have come up with in terms of uh, client-facing tools. I'd be interested to see. I'm not an advisor myself, so I wouldn't have a direct uh, use for a software like Advisor Flow, but it would be neat to see um, whether uh, for most people it sort of does as Brandon suggests, and really that is to take time away from some of the more tedious processes and move them to the more rewarding processes. Um, so this episode will be good for uh, life insurance credits in all jurisdictions. Um, it'll be good for one life credit in Alberta, no accident and sickness credits here. I don't think this is good content for ANS, so I, we're not going to submit for it. Um, and then uh, FP Canada will submit for a practice management credit. So watch because you can only have up to five practice management credits for a year. Um, and finally, on the IROC side, uh, professional development credit. And I do kind of wonder about that practice management credit, whether we'd be better to submit this as a um, financial planning credit. It's, you know, that question of client communication and sort of what's valuable time spent with a client. Um, but a lot of what we talk about here is really sort of what the software does. So uh, we're going to submit it for practice management. There'll be plenty of financial planning credits for you. Uh, the object for this episode is a photograph, a picture. Uh, that's my son, my stepson, I guess, technically, but uh, you can see it's been in my life since he was very little. Um, that's Ethan. When he was about four, we went to uh, Switzer, which is a beautiful campground up by Hinton, Alberta, about maybe 40 kilometers north of Hinton. And uh, Ethan got to help do dishes, I guess. Uh, just a, that was a fantastic trip and uh, quite memorable. Nice to have that picture. It normally sits on the shelf right about there. There we go. All right, let's uh, roll into the interview with Brandon. Uh, before we do, I just want to show um, one acronym real quick here. You'll hear Brandon um, throws around a few acronyms. Uh, one that I didn't reference here is API, an application programming interface. Um, API is a pretty common programming acronym or sort of technology acronym. And this is really where you have two different softwares that can fairly easily communicate with one another. So a lot of software makers uh, will build APIs or will really allow for the easy implementation of APIs. You know, we talk in here briefly about customer relationship management tools. And this, for example, is a real strength of Salesforce. Salesforce is well known for having a robust set of APIs. That is all kinds of other tools that can fairly easily uh, plug into Salesforce. So let's hear what Brandon has to say. And uh, following that, I'm going to have some comments about client communication. Hi, I'm today here with uh, Brandon Chapman. Brandon uh, fills a couple of roles. We're going to hear about both of them here. You're both an advisor, of course, Brandon, and you're also... A, an entrepreneur in the sort of advisor tech space. That's about right. And as we see on the wall behind you there, you're a CFP professional and both insurance and um, investment licensed. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Jason. And the, the third designation is my wife's law degree, so I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> All right. I wouldn't, yeah, I, I, I see it there now that you pointed out, but uh, yeah, perfect. I wouldn't have made that connection otherwise, thanks. Um, so can you just give us a little bit of a rundown on your practice uh, the, on the advisory side? And we'll start there and sort of who your client is, what kind of business you run. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Jason. And uh, thanks for having me on. So uh, I've been an advisor for seven years and uh, I just incorporated my practice about a year ago. We uh, take a technology driven approach to building relationships with our clients. Uh, really, the user experience is front and center, but uh, yeah, it's been interesting during the pandemic how our business was sort of well positioned um, that I largely attribute to luck. It's uh, it, it's true. Like if you were set up well for it at the beginning of pandemic, there was an opportunity there, right? Not to like take advantage of bad times or anything, but if you were ready for it, that's it. Now, your business name is interesting to me. Your um, SaaS insurance, I have that right? This is, and SAS, I, I know a lot of people know that, but SAS is software as service, which is like a techie sort of acronym. 
do you specifically attract like techie clients or do you find people sort of just show up and then three months later they find out what SaaS means? Uh, yeah, well, like most advisors, I, I grow primarily through referrals, but because my market is primarily professionals and business owners that have a heavier tilt towards the software industry, uh, that they tend to like the name. Um, but, but yeah, it, it is a bit of a play on words. Uh, so SaaS officially stands for sword and a shield, uh, which were obviously used by knights in the Middle Ages to build and protect wealth. Um, and the way I see it is sort of investments operate as the, the sword uh, or wealth building aspect of a client's portfolio. And then the, the shield is essentially the insurance. Uh, so, yeah. Sort of a double entendre type of thing going on. I like it. That's, that's nice branding. That's good. Um, now, you said that you kind of built this um, in response to your needs. I think I have that right. So can you talk about your just your own tech stack a little bit here? Brandon, like what do you use in your practice as far as uh, making your practice that tech friendly or um, tech savvy practice? Yeah, well, one of the first tools I set up was just a file storage system. So I, I presently use sync.com, uh, which is a Canadian based uh, file storage system that's very good for file sharing. Uh, so that was the first platform that I, I added. Uh, Advisor Flow started as a problem that I didn't see being addressed by any tech providers in the marketplace, which was the first mile of client discovery. So gathering facts, which you know, I'm sure we'll get into a bit later. Uh, now CRM is a bit of a challenging one because most of the CRMs in Canada aren't really integrated into the advisor's process. And so I've largely depended on, on Outlook uh, in terms of reminders, which is not ideal. But uh, as part of advisor flow, we're evaluating integrations with a number of CRMs. And so for my own practice, I'll be making that uh, jump once I'm happy with the number of integrations that we have built into uh, the CRM of choice. So you sort of touched on it here, but I'm hoping you can now go a little further down the path of your journey to being a tech entrepreneur. Um, was this something you had envisioned? Like, had you always had the dream of sort of starting a tech company or was it that there was just a gap in the market and you said, well, this is the only way it's going to get solved. Uh, yeah, well, it, it came from clients, right? So clients said, why does your onboarding process suck so much? And I said, well, there, there frankly isn't better solutions. Uh, I was during training, I, I started at uh, Freedom 55's Vancouver, Georgia office uh, seven years ago. And when I started, they gave us some Word documents and said, here you go. And those were a good place to start, especially for in-person meetings. But whenever I was trying to gather things digitally, people didn't like receiving a Word doc they had to fill out. I upgraded it to a fillable uh, PDF, which they also didn't like. Um, and then I ultimately built out a, a linked Excel sheet from sort of net worth, net cash flow, assets, liabilities. And I shared that with a number of other advisors that were facing a similar problem. And then I re realized, well, this still is a problem because when I update this, all those advisors, they don't have the updated version. And so that's when we built a 1.0 iteration of Advisor Flow, which was the cloud-based discovery tool that kind of incorporated everything that I'd learned in terms of best practice and put it into a platform that could be updated on the fly for every advisor that's on the platform. Did you uh, do the technology yourself on that or did you outsource some of that? Yeah, so fortunately, uh, I have a number of friends in the software industry, um, some of them uh, clients, obviously, and some are not. But the, the folks that were very keen in this particular industry were the ones that helped me build it out. Uh, some of the initial people I can't speak to names, but the ones that are presently on the team, I'm sure we can we can get into. But yes, it's been, a, a, I would say, me being the product manager, and then the development team has evolved over time based on the needs and requests of the advisor community. How techy are you personally? Like, do you build your own website, for example, or how far do you go with that kind of thing? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I, I'm relatively proficient. So like my, my SaaS site is on WordPress, so I can make some changes. Uh, but I am a firm believer in specialization. So I try not to be a jack of all trades. If there's people that are better at something than I, uh, and they're in my network and they would be wanting to work with me, then that's typically how I'll approach things. But uh, I did have a technology business before entering financial services. It just wasn't in the fintech space. So some of those skills do, do translate. And being a digital native when you're building a technology company certainly helps because you can understand what 
is being discussed from any member on the team, whether it's DevOps or whether it's front end or back end and how all those pieces relate. That makes sense. And that's kind of why I asked, I wasn't expecting that you were doing a bunch of the work, but really, you know, how do you learn to speak the language? How do you know what to ask for, right? All that good stuff. And that's, that's not so simple. I work at a business now that is primarily a technology business and there is a different language spoken on, on our Slack channel from what I'm used to. Yeah. It, it takes time, right? And no one's a, no one's a pro at everything, but I think no matter who you're working with, if there's trust, the foundational trust built, uh, and you get everybody on a call to discuss what you'd like to accomplish and everyone agrees with each other and understand each other, you're all good. But, but yeah, I don't think there's any successful technology company out there where, where one person sort of does everything. The, the, I see my role as really just bringing all the right people in the room to accomplish the goals and keeping them motivated and giving them the uh, tools they need to be successful. That makes sense. Now, you said that you, uh, you sort of identified this need. Did you look at other solutions beforehand? And you know, I think of some of the American solutions, like this sounds a little bit like maybe what eMoney Guide Pro would do in the US or that type of thing. What else did you look at before you said, all right, we're gonna build this ourselves? Well, early on, I, I did field the Canadian market and I didn't see a, a firm discovery tool that would address the needs that I had in my own practice. Um, later on, after we developed an MVP, I did look into the US and see Precise FP, Money Guide Pro. Um, and there is decent solutions in the States and they have morphed those into uh, Canadian options. But my whole belief was that, and, and I, I heard from many of the investment dealers in Canada, they wanted to use Canadian-based solutions and ensure that the data was stored in Canada. And so for, for me, I said, well, yeah, why would I make a move to something if no dealer has approved it uh, versus build my own platform, get it approved with dealers here. Uh, and then that is a benefit to the Canadian advisors that uh, we're building for. I'm going to translate there. MVP is minimum viable product. So yeah, it's the acronyms. Um, now, what does advisor flow do then? So what, if I'm a, an advisor, I've never used it before and I start paying your, I assume monthly fee and you know, what's, what's going to change in my practice from how I was doing things before. Yeah. So uh, Jason, uh, advisor flow offers a cloud-based uh, tool for financial advisors with pre-built client discovery forms that are based on best practices. So this includes an introductory survey for an advisor to determine if a contact should become a prospect, uh, a financial overview to determine if a prospect should be a client, uh, and then a risk survey to help determine the risk tolerance of a particular client to aid an advisor with determining uh, the right investment selection for, for a client. Uh, really how I see an advisor's practice changing by using advisor flow or really any digital solution is it instills good practice into the regular workflow of an engagement with a client. Because of many advisors, I call them uh, trunk slammers, where they uh, were used to driving door to door. Um, they'd come in, spend half an hour, an hour, ask as many questions as they can, come back with a recommendation, place business. The advisor-client relationship, due to regulatory changes, is, is adjusting, I think, for the better, to ensure that the trusted professional isn't a product salesman, but more so as a trusted guide who happens to know about products as a as a byproduct of, of the experience in the industry. Or like a, a financial planning or real like advisory type relationship. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now in terms of that KYC or the, the risk assessment question, sorry, I don't remember the exact language you used, but you talked about a risk assessment tool of some sort in there. Does the, cause you, you have different dealers who use this. So who, creates the questions in there. Is it anybody can, can build their own questions or does it come from a compliance department? Or I assume it's not just a prepackaged set of questions that has no, no sort of opportunity to change. Yeah, it's a great question, Jason. So like our uh, baseline survey for risk is based off the MFDA's requirements. Uh, now, this was our newest feature. We just rolled it out uh, at the end of summer of 2021. The expectation is that we'll have survey editing functions for that for the dealers. Um, and then the, the interesting thing we're kind of grappling with right now is customization for advisors and then customization for, for enterprises. 
Um, and so I think we've got a good handle on what that's going to look like that will solve the advisor needs and the enterprise needs. Um, but it is a complex data problem that uh, we've kind of began with the end in mind, knowing that that was where we were going. That makes sense. How many other problems like that do you have to solve? How much else is going to be variable by the business model that, that buys the, the product? Well, every uh, change to the platform or improvement has been based on feedback from the advisors. So uh, to be to the truthful answer is I'm not sure how, how many uh, changes will, will be requested, but um, I, I really look at what's happened in other industries. So if I look at the, the healthcare space, you've got applications like JNAP, uh, also a Vancouver-based uh, company that uh, powers physiotherapists globally uh, by empowering digital experiences that uh, make an, a, a client... Uh, uh, happy to work with their professional as opposed to frustrated. And I think that's a large part of what we're trying to do is make the advisory experience um, an enjoyable one and not such a frustrating one where you're transmitting data through different uh, modes that are not uh, enjoyed like mail or fax or email and putting that into a digital first experience that is intuitive from the get-go. So just talking through your own experience with this, then obviously you're using advisor flow in your practice. Um, do you, you send a client a link and the client does a bunch of, let's call it homework, although I'm sure you don't use that word maybe, but, and then you would review that and then meet with the client, go over it or correct me on where I've missed there. Oh, you, you hit it pretty well, Jason. So the, the, the process I think that most financial planners follow is there's a bit of a, are we a fit meeting at the beginning? Then there's a discovery meeting to determine more details about the client. Then the advisor is doing some analysis and coming back for a third meeting of a recommendation of a sort, whether it's a cash flow recommendation, net worth, product, et cetera. And then there's sort of opening up of accounts and maintenance of that client in perpetuity. Advisor flow is very much focused on the first few steps of determining if that prospect is a, is a fit. Uh, and then gather, gathering all the info so the advisor can complete every other aspect of that engagement without needing to go back to the client multiple times for additional information that could have very easily been collected at the onset. Curious about the, is the client or is the prospect a fit? So again, I assume that requires a fair bit of, uh, let's say, customization. So how how rigorous can I be with that as an advisor? How niche can I get or how broad can I be? Yeah, well, and, and Jason, so for the last year, we, we've only given uh, boilerplate standardized uh, templates for advisors. And we're, we're only uh, releasing the survey editing for advisors in the, uh, in the new year. Um, we previously held that just for enterprise, where we would be able to take their existing forms and build those out with the workflows that they'd like for their advisors. Um, and the reason we didn't provide enough customization out of the gate is we wanted to make sure we fully understood all potential questions that an advisor may be asking and ensure that those inputs would map to the fields that uh, an advisor will use in the remainder of their practice. I mean, that's, uh, again, that goes back to that sort of minimum viable product principles, right? You have to have something that works before you can do everything for everybody. So, you got yeah. it. Um, and then, Bren, what happens if somebody comes in there, fills out the questionnaire, and, and they're not a fit? Yeah, it's a good question, Jason, and something that I think there's alternative op like opportunities for the platform. Um, because as of now, Advisor Flow does not have a relationship with the clients that are completing the information. We're largely a tool or a vessel to help get information from the client to the advisor. And then the advisor will, will lead that conversation. But if there was a circumstance where uh, a, a potential prospect was not a fit, either the prospect didn't like the advisor, advisor didn't like the client, or didn't meet an asset threshold or whatever the potential misalignment was, there should be somewhere for that prospect to go. They shouldn't just be like, you know, see you later, sorry, we're not a fit. And like, I, I know in my own business, uh, if there's someone who I feel is not a fit, I have a couple of other advisors who fit different segments of the market. And I'll say, I, I can't help you, but here's someone who might be able to. Because um, I think ultimately, you know, why we're in this business is we, we want the financial literacy of Canadians to be ahead so that people don't get into um, negative circumstances because they didn't plan or didn't understand how the system worked. And because financial literacy is so low in Canada, it's a massive uh, 
uh, goal that we have. I uh, I saw a tweet maybe yesterday the day before that said how many advisors out there have a referral page on their home site for other advisors. Like I'm not a good fit, but here's the person that you could work with. This is the kind of thing I you know I think about with a service like that, right? It, and I think it's nice, like you say it yourself. If they're not a fit for you, you're gonna give them a little bit of a hand, right? Yeah, exactly. And and, and like I, we intentionally didn't want advisor flow to be a to communicate with clients on a regular basis because the the, the trust factor is so important with the advisors that they know the any information that's submitted to advisor flow is ultimately managed by the advisor. The advisor could delete it, send it to other platforms, and we're not communicating with with clients. So that that was the whole intent from what we built it. As the platform evolves, if we hear from the advisor community that they would want other services built in that would be more direct to the client, we could add those, but it ultimately needs to be advisor driven. Now you talked about it as being sort of that replacement for the first I can't, three months, I think, but the first bit of data collection. Is there any engagement afterwards when you have your clients using it a year, two years, three years later? Yeah, for sure. So the financial overview and the risk survey, uh, financial situations change over time. And so the concept is, is advisor information, client information is already in the platform. And so when they're re-engaging for a review, the advisor could send the same link, client updates information, and then that is then updated in the client's record within advisor flow. So we're still, it is used for a re-engagement tool in addition to that initial engagement. And how do you make sure that clients actually do it on time? <laughs> uh, that's a good question, Jason. Uh, it really depends on the advisor's relationship with the client. So the platform can help by making it intuitive. Uh, we have built some automated follow-ups that can be turned on or off by, by, client, uh, by advisors. And so we built a little bit of automation into it. But at the end of the day, if a client isn't submitting information to an advisor, usually it means that the advisor hasn't made a compelling enough argument as to why the client should go through this process with them. That's fair. So, the um, so do you have an assistant in your own practice? Do you have an actual like in-person assistant who's somewhere within like a hundred miles of you? For sure. And Jason, to be clear, I'm I'm actually very much a proponent of human advice and human interaction with humans. Yeah. I just don't like frustrating pa paperwork and process. And so I try to eliminate that to in increase the amount of in-person engagement and the real time that I get with my clients as opposed to the administrative time. Uh, but yeah, to answer your question, I have uh, three team members with SAS that work with me. One is focused specifically on account opening, uh, and transactions and trades on the investment side. Uh, the second is on insurance and on research of uh, prospective clients. And then the third is on marketing and communications. Yeah, I did notice on the, the SaaS, I think, no, sorry, I apologize, on the Advisor Flow website, there's that sort of positioning on there that says, what would you do with your assistant if they had an extra like 10 hours a week or something like that, right? I can't remember the exact framing, but, you know, so in that vein, is that what you found here is that you're able to free up more, like you said, the second person does sort of client research. That's a, an interesting function. I don't know how many folks have somebody on their team doing that kind of work. So did you have to kind of get creative around this and say, look, I still want to keep this great team working with me. Now we got to find things to do. Or did they come to you and say like, hey, Brandon, I've got an extra 10 hours a week. What did this look like? Well, at first, I think every advisor should ask their team members, what do they enjoy doing as part of their, their business? Uh, and a lot of times, at least in my practice, they said, well, I don't like having to deal with all of this paperwork and process as part of this particular uh, financial institution's requirements. And I said, well, yeah, I don't like you doing that either. It's actually a waste of time. Um, and that's a large part of what we're solving with, with advisor flow is making the collection easier. And then the transposition, uh, the more open API connections we can make, the better. Uh, but, but yeah, in terms of aligning team member interest and, um, uh, where their skill lies, that has, was, was always my, my focus. And so the investment side, I would rather assistants don't have to do anything with regards to paperwork. Now, Tari's, uh, transfer requests still need to be faxed. I think with all dealers. So that's, there's intentionally roadblocks there, which I think makes some sense, um, 
but at the same time, if the account opening process, the updating KYCs, if all of that can be done completely digitally without the need for an assistant to scan or upload. And I know you're probably like, oh, wow, dealers still require that. Yes, they do. Uh, right. I hear it all the time. Yeah. I don't have to deal with it myself, thankfully. I haven't faxed something in a long time. But uh, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that. I mean, I know it's a nightmare and whatever. Right. Um, so. Then in terms of uh, compliance, right, on the compliance side. So what do you hear from your clients about how this overlaps with, helps with, maybe runs into snags with their compliance requirements? Yeah, I think all compliance teams are in a state of flux right now, just given all of the changes going on in the industry, plus all of the new technology that is being used by advisors on a regular basis. Uh, and I think that every advisor needs to have a conversation with their compliance leads about what they want their ideal process to look like, what technology they think can solve those problems, and then ensuring that their compliance teams agree with uh, what they're using and why. Ultimately, it comes down to if you're using a tool, which other agencies have already approved this particular tool um, and are, which advisors are already using it, that's a good first step before using any particular tool. Um, and I had to go through steps before I started using advisor flow within my own practice. So I think every advisor should go through that, but it's a nice baseline to know, okay, well, this person and this person are using it. They're in my dealer. They've already gone through those steps. That makes it a little easier for the new advisor to engage with digital tools to enhance the process. As I understand it, you're mostly doing, I'm going to say, sort of enterprise level sales, like your preferred clients would be like MGAs or dealers. Is that... So we actually started focusing on independent advisors to, because okay. I saw them as being the early adopters. Yep. Uh, however, over time we have gotten more enterprise interest because if advisors like what we're using, they talk about it with their MGAs or dealers. Uh, longer term, I, I do think both segments of the market are important. Uh, and that's why we're providing the customization to independence as well as enterprise, because enterprises can build compliant controls and have larger pocketbooks in order to build out functionality. But independents have more specific needs and more specific niches they might work with in which they need flexibility of, of products and services and aren't stuck with a technology from the 90s because their dealer just can't invest in it at the moment. So there has to be a, a balancing act between the two. And I guess you would understand that very well, having started at a career shop, right? And get to see the, the stuff that's made available, but also where there's, say, barriers in place, right? How much of your work is then interacting with those compliance departments at the firms that your advisors are using? So typically the people that we speak to at an enterprise level are on the operations front, they're on compliance and they're on sales. So the, the people that care about this tool are the ones that are a uh, overseeing their, their sales teams. Um, they're pushing their sales teams to you know, sell more product per se, uh, or to reach certain client objectives. Th that's what their focuses are. For us, we're, we're considering how can our technology accomplish their job easier? Uh, but, but yeah, so I, I would say it's quite regular or common on an enterprise level. Uh, on an individual advisor level, oftentimes there's just some email communications back and forth, but we wouldn't communicate directly with the, um, with the compliance team. I wanted to just circle back to your comments earlier about dealing with your clients. So what you had said is that because you're able to get so much of that, say, I don't know, I, quantitative information hammered out via advisor flow, you have a lot more time for real conversations with your clients. Um, so do you find that you're putting in the same amount of time with clients now and just having a, a deeper dive? Or do you find that you actually are, are carving out client time? How do, you, how do you think about that? Clients don't want to be on a two hour meeting. Clients, uh, typically an hour, hour and a half is the sort of that ideal sweet spot for a, for a planning conversation, whether it's a review or if it's an initial engagement. So I found when I didn't have advisor flow, I was spending more time asking about the nuts and bolts of their financial situation. And then I was rushed asking about the goals. Now I can 
take my time asking about goals and diving deeper into what they want to achieve for their business, what they want their family life to look like 10, 20 years from now, who they care about, which charities do they care about, really getting into the questions that evoke emotion, as opposed to the questions that, at least the way I think about it, could have been done during a form and tech process, just like before you walk into your doctor's office. I'm assuming that this is a never ending process for you. You must have this happen where you're sitting across from a client, you ask a question, you're like, oh, why didn't we think about that earlier? Does your team get sick of it? <laughs> well, um, so we use a sauna, so it's, it's full of potential yeah. uh, updates, both from like my own practice and other advisors in the platform. But we always are prioritizing development based on uh, the number of requests we're getting about a particular feature and also the amount of time it will re require to implement that feature. But yeah, and I, and I think our industry what wasn't thinking like this for so long and it allowed the advisors to almost just say, well, that's just the way it is. And they just operated their business thinking that things couldn't change. But now finally COVID has shone a light on, on the antiquated systems and processes. Uh, and you've got FinTechs you know, competing with advisors that have shown it is very possible to do this. And so the firms are needing to quickly catch up and some advisors are in a good place and others really need to step up their game. Asana is the one with the, uh, the three, like the fake 3M sticky pads, right? I've got Asana right there. Isn't that the one you move around the sticky pads as you accomplish tasks? It's yeah, it's, it's that basically, yeah, but it's, yeah, it's yeah. You know, the digital version of that. <laughs> yeah. We use that. Uh, oh, previously. You? Yeah. Yeah. I liked it, but uh, yeah, now the new company uses something different for project management. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so can we uh, just go back to your team then a little bit? You had said you wanted to just talk about, and I think it's a, a good thing to highlight here. Who do you have on the advisor flow team? And then do you contract anything out that way? Yeah, so um, Bill and Shireen are, uh, have been with us for the last, essentially since the beginning. Uh, Bill has a deep software security background uh, from his other professional experience. And considering the compliant environment we work in, uh, that has been extremely beneficial for the development of our platform. Shireen has been leading our uh, marketing and communication strategy, uh, also leveraging her industry expertise. She has worked with a number of financial advisors uh, as well, which really has helped frame a lot of our sort of content and how we approach, uh, whether it's email communication or LinkedIn. Uh, it's not about selling a uh, product. It's more about adding value and building community relationships. And so that's really how we've built things out. The, the remainder of the advisor flow team has joined over, over the last nine months uh, and they've largely come through referral, uh, either from the technology industry or uh, the Simon Fraser University uh, community, because I, I'm an alumni and uh, active uh, participant in, in much of the uh, work that the university does. And did you start off with a team or did you sort of start off, because you said before you kind of dipped into friends expertise and that kind of thing. So like, did you have to build up enough revenue to support a team or did you let your advisory practice sort of support the development of advisor flow? What did that look like? Well, yeah, originally it was definitely just, um, I only saw it as me solving a problem for my practice. So I invested accordingly. Uh, and then once the pandemic hit, uh, so around May of last year, that's when uh, I ratcheted things up from a, my own investment as well. We started seeing actual revenue in the platform that could justify uh, this, this, the team members that we were adding to, to build out the platform. I didn't realize that everything you had done was sort of like, and I get that you had built pre pandemic, but I did not realize that sort of all your growth was post pandemic, which I know it feels like forever ago, but not really that long ago. Right. It was really a year and a half ago. Right. Like that's, that's yeah. when things ratcheted up for us. And when we started hiring team members, uh, we do contract out some work, uh, but we, we do like to keep team members involved to uh, have a long-term approach to what we're doing uh, as opposed to just kind of piecemeal. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Brandon, especially, you know, if you're not like you're not the guy in the business, you have to have other people there like you're running two businesses, right? You can't do everything in two businesses. And nor do I want to. Right. Um, I, I'd rather have the best people doing things that uh, I'm not good at. And I focus on understanding advisor needs and 
Um, our UI UX designer will map that out in terms of what that might look like. And then we'll test that out with a few advisors. What do they think? And then we'll kind of iterate and improve it for time. Perfect. And uh, UI UX is user interface and user experience. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Sorry. <laughs> but thanks. Um, it's, I, I love it though. It's good. It's, uh, and you test me a little bit here, which is all right. Um, so you mentioned earlier the residency of, um, I don't think you used the word servers, but you talked about being resident in Canada. Um, and it's something I hear all the time and I hear a lot of um, mixed opinions on. You know, some people say like, no matter what, everything is stationed in the United States ultimately anyways. And essentially the Patriot Act gives us no real protections or I hear some people still say, no, it's gotta be like north of, I'm going to say north of 49, even though I know that's not quite right, but got to be in Canada no matter what. You know, what's the what's the truth there from from what you've seen? Yeah, well, uh, we've used utilized Amazon Web Services Canadian data warehouses since square one, and that was a requirement for my own practice and many of our early adopters. We'll plan to continue focusing our development to benefit Canadian advisors. Uh, as I do think that is a unique uh, differentiator for us. Um, do I think that it's reasonable that Canadian companies think that? Yes, to an extent that the way America operates business is sort of a winner take all mentality. And um, they already do have a hand in many of our businesses up here. You look at Lowe's, you look at Tim Hortons, like do we want to have our financial system controlled by Americans as well? At the end of the day, I think there's a little bit of patriotism um, baked into the data security and, and data safety perspective. You know, as you say, you use uh, AWS Canada for that. About two weeks ago, I think it was, AWS East Coast went down and took like half the internet with it for a few hours. Um, how do you think about that kind of risk? Like that's a really um, out of your control risk, right? What do you What do you do around that kind of thing? Yeah, so this would be a great question for Bill as he's sort of our infrastructure expert. Right. Um, but the way uh, the, the way we've had conversations about this is that even if any system is down, advisor data is never lost. So we do have backups uh, stored elsewhere that are also secure. But from an operations perspective, AWS is hard to beat. They just have built such a strict uh, data storage and data security um, process that it's it's difficult to use anyone else. Yeah, I think that as far as going to the people who are best at what they're doing, that's, that's it, right? I mean, find me somebody who's not, somebody big who's not using AWS, right? Yeah, and I like to say to advisors, if they have a problem, they can call me or, or send me an email and I'm gonna respond. Uh, if you're working with a nameless company from any, whether it's the US or somewhere elsewhere, they can't necessarily speak to the decision makers. And it's buried upon layers of invest investors that lead to a point where the advisor voice isn't actually necessarily the one making the decisions with that company. Yeah. Um, do you feel, are you backing yourself into a corner with that or are you like that's, you'll be a victim of your own success one day? Well, we may raise it in the future, but the way I look at raising capital is uh, we would only raise from smart money, which would be in investors who have a vested interest in the advisor tech community uh, and believe in our vision of empowering advisors with intuitive technology to better serve Canadians uh, with their financial planning. And so if, if there was an investor that was looking to do something else, uh, we'd be hard pressed to find alignment. Okay. And you and I met through um, Curtis Findlay, um, mutual friend, and uh, you... Um, essentially, I think you've taken on Curtis's role of the Advocates uh, Technology Committee. Is that what's the actual name of that committee? Sorry. That... Well, well, yeah, Curtis Finley, he, great guy. I think we're, we're both very fortunate to have him as a friend. He was the founding member of what was called the Advocates Technology Task Force. Yeah. And, and more recently, that the name changed to the Advocates Technology and Innovation Committee because it's going to be a longstanding committee with, with Advocates now. And can you talk a little bit about what happens there? I, I'm not aware of any sort of other organization like this in Canada. I think it's it, it's a valuable organization. Can you talk a little bit what happens? For sure. So um, I was fortunate enough to be selected to join back in 2017 uh, when the task force was formed. Curtis, Curtis really meshed the traditional way of thinking when it comes to the financial advice space of the average advisor 
but he also had a very keen focus on understanding what changes were occurring in the technology industry that were relevant to financial advisors. So that research that we did in the early days helped morph the committee into what it is today. And really the overall mission of the, of the committee is to help advocates members understand technology, help accelerate uh, members learning about technology tools that can benefit their practice and um, support advocates' advocacy efforts with regards to technology regulators, just to ensure that tech companies aren't perhaps given a, a leg up over uh, financial advisors and that it's a, a level playing field. And then I think to make sure that advisors have a place to suitably um, experiment or innovate too, right? Is there some of that? Yeah, so there's there's four committees um, that are bundled into our uh, four sub working groups. Um, one is the digital catalog, which is a curated list of tools that have been vetted by the technology task force, sorry, tech and innovation committee. Um, that essentially makes it easy for the an average advisor to quickly filter through CRM, financial planning, client onboarding, uh, and find tools that might work in their in their practice. Second is education of the advocates membership. And so we do regular presentations to advocates members about what, uh, what's happening in, in the industry uh, and why they might consider integrating technology to better support their, their clients. Uh, but the one you just spoke about, uh, which is, is a newer focus of ours, which is collaboration with FinTech accelerators across the country. And really what we're trying to do is support future tech development and bridging the conversation with new tech entrants and advisors. So advisors can be part of that conversation. And it's not sort of a FinTech versus advisor, but FinTech and advisor working together to provide the best possible experience for the end client. How many of the folks on the committee are pure advisors? Are there others that are like yourself, sort of a, a dual background? And are there pure tech people on the committee as well? I'm, I'm a bit of a weird one, so there's not many that do both, I think, but uh, we've had a good mix of advisors. Uh, I think it's about 50-50 right now between advisors and then either leaders of technology firms uh, or uh, executives within uh, wealth or insurance type organizations. All of them have a distinct interest and knowledge of the fintech space and the wealth tech space. And so if you look at the roster of people on the list, uh, like Jean-Francois Demar is an advisor out of Ontario. Uh, Kelly Gustafson, she's worked with, uh, with IDC and Raymond James. Uh, Herman Chan with Canada Life. Charlie Conron with Life Design Analysis. Dylan Friedman of PEXA. Then you got Samuel Waxman and Zaina Williams, who are both advisors. So it's, 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 a, it's a very good mix. And we try to keep, keep it balanced between people who have knowledge of industry, people who have knowledge of the advisory space, and ensuring that we can really uh, add value to the membership and, and keep, keep essentially just keep advisors relevant when it comes to tech. Because if you asked three years ago, tech companies wouldn't want to work with us because we were so old school. Good that you had those names handy like that. That's, uh, that's impressive. Um, so just in general, I mean, is this your first uh, endeavor volunteering with a committee like this? Or have you been you talked about working with SFU before too, right? With your alumni organization. Have you worked with other industry type of um, organizations like this, or is this your first crack at something like this? Uh, that's a, it's a good question, uh, Jason. Overall, my thought is that everybody should volunteer with something they care about. Like I've, I've hosted some trips with Habitat for Humanity. We've gone to Zambia and built some homes. And I was president of SFU's alumni association. Uh, been involved in like the uh, boards of trade locally, but there's always like give and take. Um, I, I believe that givers gain. So if you give a lot to something and you care about it and you're passionate about it, it it'll come back to you in, in some way, shape or form. Um, but I, I don't know if that answers the question. I think so. And actually, as I think about this, you said you've been on that committee since 2017, right? Correct. So your time there predates advisor flow or at least yeah. predates advisor flow as a commercial tool. Correct. So do you think that being there sort of made, because you, you like Charlie Conron is a, he's a tech entrepreneur, right? Um, do you think that seeing other people doing that was useful in you thinking about starting advisor flow as a, as an actual entity? 
Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Like I got into financial services because I, I had an entrepreneurial interest and background. I just would love the ability to build a business, spending time with people that I like and helping them make decisions and making money. Like that was a big benefit of entering financial services for me. Um, and then the, the frustration of the tech in combination with research about what's going on in the space certainly helped. Uh, but originally it was just trying to solve problems. And I hope I had hoped other technology tools would have solved these problems. Was I, I'm very happy with my practice. I would have just continued to do that. But I found that there was many tech companies that were trying to do something like what we're doing, but they didn't have the knowledge of what's happening in other industries to apply it to a usable product that understands the needs of the industry, the needs of the regulators, the needs of the advisors and the clients. Because there's all these different stakeholder groups that all need to be considered. So you mentioned a couple going off script here a little bit, Brandon, but you mentioned a couple of technology tools right at the beginning, but you know, you say if the tool had been there, you wouldn't have developed it. What else is out there that, that you're using in your practice that you think other advisors would really benefit from picking up? Yeah, um, well, I've been a big supporter of Advisor Stream, which is a Toronto-based uh, content production platform. Uh, Kevin Mulhern and the team there have done a great job with that tool. Um, Recently, I've come across another platform that's similar called Hey Advisor, uh, and they're uh, newer, but they provide a lot of infographics, which I think are relevant for the millennial generation that uh, maybe don't want to consume uh, as much text and pre prefer to see more, more pictures. Um, but yeah, so those are two uh, that I think are interesting. Uh, from a financial planning perspective, I'm, I'm liking Planworth, Tarson out of Toronto. I think he's built a pretty a slick platform for the high net worth cases. Uh, and I'm looking at integrating that into my business shortly. Uh, everyone's heard of Conquest. They do a great job of marketing. Uh, I think that for mass market, their product is going to do wonders and will certainly help replace uh, technologies that aren't really focused on innovating for the advisor experience. Um, yeah, but there's a few for you, Jason. Yeah, that's good. That's helpful. Thanks. And uh... Yeah, I'll put some links to some of those too. So um, what about uh, just going back to the Advocates Technology and Innovation Committee? Now I got it right, right? Um, what have you seen there that you think would surprise advisors? Uh, I think most advisors are surprised when I tell them that most fintechs that are operating in our space are not profitable and likely will not be profitable unless they pursue different business models. And, and, and I think when I tell advisors that it almost is like a reassurance because they're always some of them think, oh, well, I'm, I'm worried I might lose my job. So I'm, I'm, I'm scared of technology. But in reality, if you look at where Portage Ventures money went into Wellsimple and the direct to consumer fintechs in 2017, most of the people who put their money, the investors who put their money at that point have taken money off the table from direct consumer tech in the wealth space and have moved it to advisor supporting tech. And so if you can follow that big money, you can see, oh, consumers don't actually want to lose their advisor. They just want a better user experience. And you see this with the number of, I hate this word so much, but the number of pivots that uh, like the robos have taken and whether, you know, south of the border, you see the robos there still kind of messing around a little bit, trying to find where they belong, right? It's, uh, and yeah, I just don't think that we've had the, success stories in Canada that a lot of people anticipated in the early days of some of the robos kicking off here. So, and I, I you know, I'm, I'm pretty active on the group benefit side too. And I think the group benefits experience very much mirrors that where a lot of group advisors saw that and said, you know, what's going on here? And it just hasn't been the way. And it's been these sort of hybrid or cyborg solutions that have been the, uh, the bigger, I don't even want to say money makers, but viable businesses anyways. Well, and the problem is too, you'll just see a, you know, a good quality tech solution that gets acquired by XYZ Corp and then it gets put on the shelf and collects dust and it doesn't actually change the industry. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that some of the technologies that are presently in the marketplace are going to be the ones that do help get us to the stage where advisors aren't seen as fossils and they're seen as like data aggregation and data connection between all the systems and advice, like that should be table stakes, but it's not because of all the turf wars between these people who control large segments of the market. 
So on that note, do you think that there's going to be, and maybe there's something like this happening already, but I'm not aware of it, you know, like somebody like Portage, somebody with deep pockets, is there the possibility there of a sort of roll up where they would come and start acquiring, you know, firms like yours and, you know, you go back to advisor stream or try to create a sort of one-stop shop. Have you seen anything like that? Well, you could argue Portage already is kind of doing that. If you look at Conquest and Digit uh, that are offering sort of the back office and financial planning. Uh, I, I do very much respect uh, Paul Demery and um, the, the Portage team. I think they've done a, a phenomenal job of pushing the innovation ecosystem further along. And, and really I see Well Simple as the anti-bank. So they're gonna eat into the bank's profits. Uh, I don't see them as digging into ours. Uh, per se, I think, I think the fee or the revenue per client will go down um, because advisors are going to be able to serve more leveraging technology. But I don't know if the whole system needs to be controlled. I, I think it actually, I think the most innovative products come out of competition. And if you have sort of mono, monopolies or duopolies, it, it, it does, like look at the big banks, for example, they're just sitting on their high horse, borrowing at 0.25 and lending out at two, two and a half. And just recording record profits while the you know, average Canadian net worth is drop, dropping uh, specific, specifically along the uh, middle class with lower class, that's not beneficial for long-term economic uh, uh, reward for, for Canada. But anyway, a bit of a tangent. <laughs> that's good. All right. Um, any last minute thoughts for us, Brandon? Uh, well, I just want to say thank you, Jason. I, I think uh, what you're doing here is uh is, is so necessary. You and Jason Ferreira are both, uh, I would say, helping lead the conversation about financial advice. Uh, him more on the tech side and you more on the education side, but really do appreciate you, you having me on. Um, and yeah, if I can help at all with any of your fin financial literacy endeavors, I uh, would love to collaborate with you more in the future. Thanks so much. And thanks for doing your volunteer work. Thanks for building a, a you know, a good uh, advisor facing product and, um, and uh, you know, to be named <laughs> the same company as Jason Ferrer is uh, that's great. So I'll take it, but um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day then. Thanks so much for doing this, Brandon. So I wanted to take this opportunity. I don't believe I've talked about this book before on the podcast, but I quite like it. It's this uh, communication essentials for financial planners. And I think it's going to be flipped around there. Sorry about that. But anyways, you can kind of figure it out there. I'll put a link in the show notes for this one as well. And it's by, and I know one of the authors here, uh, John Grable, and uh, Joseph Gates. I don't know Joseph at all, but I know John. Um, I see him at a lot of conferences, and he really is like the voice of authority um, sort of when he starts to talk. So the reason I mention this is because, you know, Brandon talks in the um, interview or in the interview a little bit about uh, taking time away from those sort of hardcore uh, quantitative questions, you know, digging into net worth and so forth and getting more into client, uh, questions, and he used the word here to evoke emotion. And I think that's a really good way to frame this. Uh, there's lots of good resources out there on this front. Um, this is something I know Carl Richards talks about quite a bit, and for that matter, Michael Kitsis as well on their Kitsis and Carl podcasts. And I think uh, you'll hear Carl talk about the, the Jack Kinder questions. And there's uh, all kinds of versions of this. I have a uh, story, story, well, story selling for financial advisors by uh, Mitch Anthony on my shelf over here. And uh, Mitch has a, a good uh, block of questions like that. Um, Bill Backrack has questions like that. Um, if you follow uh, the Kitsis blog, which I think you should, I think every financial advisor should be reading pretty much every um, version every uh, iteration of the Kitsis blog, but you'll see Megan Lertz uh, post there quite a bit about client questions and how to frame specific kinds of conversations. So there's lots of resources out there. And it's another area, it's like many areas of financial advice. I think that we can sort of take it for granted. We can say, you know, I'm an effective communicator. I get what I need out of my clients. Uh, but I think it's one of these areas that is always worth some introspection am I really doing the best things in terms of my client communication? And some of this is about, and you know, Brandon talked about this in, e in the interview about respecting your client's time. You, I'm not suggesting we should be completely mercenary about this, but at the same time, if you can have a, a good conversation with a client in an hour, 
where you build trust with that person and you gather the information that is needed and then you can sort of get them out and doing whatever else they want to do. I, I just think that's better than having the same result in an hour and a half or two hours. And some of that comes from having some real structure given to how we communicate with clients. So, you know, if you're going to use a tool like this, um, and I don't care whether it's advisor flow or whatever else, although obviously I think that, uh, you know, I'd love to see people patronize our guest businesses. Um, but when you're integrating tools like this, you got to say, well, what am I actually trying to accomplish here? And I think the thing you're trying to accomplish is to uh, optimize uh, your time, uh, your staff's time, your client's time, and really try to get all of that as efficient as possible. And again, I don't want to be overly mercenary about this. And certainly you're going to have conversations with the client that go long, situations where you've got the client sort of uh, crying on your proverbial shoulder. And, and that's all well and good. But again, I think that we can have some intentionality, some design here. I, we talked with this with uh, Lori Power back in season two, this idea that we have some intentionality in how we build our business and how we build our processes. So the, uh, the chapter I want to reference here in the Grable book is uh, chapter five. It's questioning. And I know that there's some things in here that we all know. So the book starts off or the chapter starts off with the, the two sort of ways that I think we frame questions, whether a question is open-ended or closed-ended. And of course, that's a useful starting point. So open-ended questions tend to be designed to elicit sort of longer responses and great. Uh, and there are times when we need those open-ended questions. And in fact, what I would suggest is if we follow uh, Brandon's line of thinking here, that we're going to be allowing more use of open-ended questions. Okay. However, from time to time, we might need to use the, of course, alternative here, which is closed-ended questions. And a closed-ended question is simply one that's designed to elicit a fairly short answer. Okay. Now, there are lots of examples of this given in this book, in this client communications book. Um, and you get this uh, sort of framing around, well, what's really an open-ended question and what's really a closed-ended question? And one of the things that, uh, that the authors talk about here, um, John and Joseph talk about, is when we, and I think I do this, I think you hear this sometimes in my interview questions, and it happens sometimes when you're thinking on your feet about a question. Um, it's something I know I'm guilty of, or I don't know if guilty is the right word, but let's go with it. Um, a question like this, uh, how did you feel when you lost money in the stock market for the first time? That right there is an open-ended question, and that would give somebody a fair bit of opportunity to answer. Now, I think what happens sometimes is we say, oh, that might be kind of an uncomfortable question, or the person I'm asking might not know what exactly I'm thinking. And I think sometimes we do this when we see maybe not that immediate response. You know, you ask a question, and maybe we're not willing to let that dead air hang for two or three seconds, or sometimes longer, and we rush in, we rush to sort of fill in that, uh, that dead air. So the way we transform what would be an open-ended question into a closed-ended question would be like this. How did you feel when you lost money in the stock market for the first time? Did you lose sleep at night? And what we've done there is we've tried to sort of fill that gap and maybe rob the client of the ability to give a full answer. That's what uh, is identified here as a question transformation. It, it can be a conscious technique, but it's not something that we should be using. So when you ask that question, give that person that opportunity to, to fill in that space, let them answer. And again, there might be some uncomfortable silence there. And if they don't understand the question, hey, then that's fine. They'll come back and say, oh, I don't really know what you mean here. Or maybe they come back with a is it normal for people to lose sleep over their investments? And that might give you the opportunity to maybe tell a, a relevant client story, something like that. So allowing that clarification to happen could also be quite useful. Um, we have what are called swing questions. And swing questions are questions where it could be open-ended or it could be closed-ended. So an example straight out of the book here is, uh, will you give me an idea of how much is in the account? And 
this is rather than just saying flat out, what's the dollar amount in the account or what's that account balance? Um, that way, if the client has a little bit more to say about it, they are given that opportunity, sort of that permission to swing that from what might be a closed-ended question to an open-ended question. Now, the challenge here that, uh, that is pointed out by the authors is that if we're not at a stage where we're quite comfortable with the client, that is, this might not be a lead early in a conversation because it can sound kind of like a dumb question if there's not already a good rapport happening. And then the final type of question that is, sorry, the second last type of question, I apologize, that's uh, discussed here is implied and projective questions. And these are sort of questions where there's a, a sort of long-term, and these are, I think, really important financial planning questions, these sort of long-term questions. You know, what would you do if you could start your retirement today? Or how do you envision that retirement? Or how do you envision uh, your kids' uh, relationships with money when they're adults? Those types of questions that, that really are expecting somebody to, I think, exert a, a fair bit of creativity and maybe we get some values and some of the, the stuff we really want to uh, boil down, the stuff that, again, we heard Brandon talk about as evoking emotion. And then what is the final type of question this time I mean it, um, that uh, John and Joseph referred to here are scaling questions. And I think if you're going to use scaling questions, there has to be some framing for this earlier on. So if you're gonna do these, these are you know, on a scale of one to 10, how much stress are you experiencing? Or on a scale of one to 10, how comfortable are you with this retirement plan? Or on a scale of one to 10, how confident are you that you're still going to be having the same employment income at this point next year, or a couple of years from now, that kind of thing. And I think if you don't have uh, some useful starting point for that, that is if you don't have a, a baseline or a framework around asking those questions, it's not really a, a great way to ask a question. So, and these are very much something that comes out of you know, academic literature. You'd hear academics here talk about a Likert scale. So it, it's good. I think these kinds of questions can be really helpful. Um, but again, I think they have to be asked within a fairly clear framework. And probably only useful to ask if you've asked the client a, either the same question or a very similar version of this question sort of over and over. Okay, uh, the number for today's episode is five. The number for today's episode is five. And I hope you'll join me again in two weeks time. In two weeks, we're gonna be talking with uh, Christian about joint ownership of assets. It's a topic that uh, I've talked about briefly before here on the podcast, but we're really going to put a full episode into some of the, uh, let's say, trials and tribulations of joint ownership of assets. Uh, thanks very much for joining me and enjoy your continued studies. Thanks very much for joining us. You'll be able to do your quiz by creating an account and subscribing for $15 a month or $150 a year at businesscareercollege.com. Those who subscribe on an annual basis will also have access to three half-day continuing education seminars covering a variety of topics and capturing a range of different continuing education credit requirements. In order to get your credits for this episode, you'll have to do a short five-question quiz. You'll need the number that I went over just after the interview, the object that I displayed at the beginning of the interview, and you'll also have to recall a few details, nothing too challenging from the episode. Once you have completed the quiz, within the course where you did the quiz, you'll be able to click at the top right corner. And from there, you'll be able to choose the option to view wall certificate. That's how you'll see your CE credits. Hang on to that, although the system will hang on to it as well. I would like to acknowledge the efforts of a few people in getting this episode to air. Jocelyn Lord. Renny Wong and Sushami Pamela Paquette are the amazing marketing team at We Know Training, which is Business Career College's parent company. Sush also does our video content. Joseph Tong composed the theme music and does the sound editing for every episode, as well as uploads the episodes to all audio platforms. Maria Nguyen takes care of all our CE approvals. <laughs>